year here at USF. Um, and when I'm not here, I live in Boulder, Colorado. And I'm Kate Moncrief. I'm the other dramaturg and play seminar director. We're working the ones here. Kate and Isabel in the mornings. And uh, when I am not here, I live in Massachusetts. I'm the head of humanities and arts at Worcester College. Um, professor this year's season with the festival. So to join us, I apologize for with us, the production dramaturg. Uh, and that means that Isabel was in the room for the entire process and was part of the artistic decision. So she's going to be able to answer the questions that the director might normally be able to answer. So I'm going to start out by asking Isabel for two things. Just a little bit of, of historical background in hot summer. We're not going to do a lecture here, but we're going to take all the bullet points because I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of plot in this place <laughs> and a lot of characters. So I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to ask her to talk about the concept. Then we're going to open it up for your questions. Isabel. Yes. <laughs> it's your okay. Um, so I'm going to avoid giving a lecture. It's very easy to put these plays. Uh, so these are very early Shakespeare plays. Maybe if you notice that the language doesn't really compared to what you see in a play like Twelfth Night or Hamlet. And it's because Shakespeare is a very young man. Um, he's, he's writing these plays. He's reinventing the history play as he writes these plays. Um, and, and, and so he's just, he's, he grows as a playwright. Um, these plays were very, very popular in their time. And we know this because they were published in a bunch of different sources. Um, and it, it's, it's because they were kind of present and visceral for everybody in Shakespeare's day. So whether if you watch Game of Thrones or not, I remember the books, um, uh, you heard of Game of Thrones, and it was exactly the same with these plays. In fun fact, they are both based on the same source material. So Game of Thrones is our Henry the Sixth parts one, two, and three. Um, the plays center on the War of the Roses, which is a, an English conflict that all of Shakespeare's audiences would have been immediately familiar with, but of course, we are not. Um, and it's a little bit hard to follow what the actual issue is, besides a bunch of different people want the crown and they want power. So, in brief, and I can go into more detail on this, um, the short version is that Edward III, which is Henry's great-great-grandfather, had seven sons. His oldest son had a son, and that's Richard II. And there's a play about that too. And Richard II was not a popular ruler at all, and he died without an heir. He had named his, his aunt and her husband, Warmer, the new heirs after his death because he didn't have one. But Henry Bolingbroke, who's from the fourth child in, in, in Edward III's seven kids, comes with an army and challenges Richard to trial by combat and, and through the divine right of kings, because he wins this combat, he is now king. So he's a bit of a usurper, he's kind of a, a rebellion depending on who you ask, or he's rightfully king because he won the combat. So he becomes Henry IV, and there's a couple plays about that too. He has a son, Henry V, or Hal, we use that with false staff in these plays. Um, and Henry V is wildly popular. He does a really good job of uniting England and France. He's a really big, and so you never quite learned to be a king on his own. Uh, and he's a very unpopular, and he's the opposite of Henry V, overly pious. Uh, and so, in comes the House of York. Henry is the House of Lancaster. Um, if you like Game of Thrones, it's the Lancers. And so in comes the House of York, or the Starks in Game of Thrones. And the House of, of York's claim is on both sides of the of, of, of Richard's. So his mother is the Neville side of the tree, which is from Edward III's youngest son. His father is from Philippa, who is her son. Um, as Jamie says in the play of Warwick, is, is anything more clear than this? So that's the issue. Basically, that 
York has claim on, on both sides of his family. And Henry only has it on one, but it, it's through a man who's older than it, the man in York's family. And that's the issue. <laughs> Could you add to it the roses, what those symbols are? Sure. So the roses that we see. The House of York is the white rose, and the House of uh, Lancaster is the red rose. And I don't actually know the symbolism or why that came to be. The House of Tudor comes in and combines them. Um, did anybody see Henry VI Part One last year? Oh, good. Oh, great. So in that scene when they're in the garden and they're plucking the roses and throwing the roses down, that, that's really the Shakespearean end. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's the kind of historical background on this play. There's obviously a lot more, and every named character in this play is a person from history. Um, and each of those twelve actors plays something like eight parts at least. So, and there's still one more part of this story to come, right? So Shakespeare writes in history plays, and Isabel's done a really good job of summar summarizing. But we go Richard the Second, Henry the Fourth, Part One, Henry the Fourth, Part Two, Henry the Fifth, Henry the Sixth, Part One, Part Two, Part Three, and bonus round. Richard the Third. Again, <laughs> excellent. Uh, he writes the Henry plays or the Henry Six plays earlier. So the plays that come later in the story, he writes earlier. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, the director's vision for this production? So we know it was the same director of last year, and you saw that outdoors. The action starts up basically where we left off last year. Uh, but we moved this indoor to the games. And could you talk a little bit about some of the, the vision and choices on this production? Yeah, so, um, so Henry is a very skilled director at finding the, the thread of story through these very complicated plays. So he knew that he wanted to do them in rep inside um, because they work better together. Um, just seeing part two alone would be kind of confusing. Um, and he knew that he wanted a small cast so that the whole experience felt more intimate and more like a family drama that it really is at his heart. Um, Henry the Sixth Part One is really a play about battles. Um, and parts two and three are really plays about family and the destruction of the monarchy as, as people knew it in the medieval order. And so he really thought that the best way to show that was to kind of pare it down and put it inside and put us all close to it so that we could all kind of feel a part of it, even though it's a very foreign kind of idea for us to, you know, the idea of a, of a powerful family in the monarchy. Okay, let's open this up to your questions. And our, our amazing assistant, Darcy, is going to run the microphone around to you. So we'll raise your hands and she, she's in charge. Uh, I'm dying to know what the process and the, and the rationale was for changing periods midstream in the two plays. Sure. Um, Not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about it? I totally found it uncalled for and distracting. Okay. Did anyone have an opposite opinion? Who like that choice? I knew there was I'm still it. processing. <laughs> still processing. <laughs> yeah, so the idea behind that was to, um, so first and foremost, this is a very long afternoon theater, right? It's four hours. And having the same characters in exactly the same style and costumes for that long might actually kind of get tiring to look at that that was an idea that that we had um uh and so <laughs> and and the other idea is that a lot of time passes in these plays of course it's not centuries but a lot of time passes and we wanted to find a way to kind of show that um and, and, and at the end of it, to really feel like we've been through something and things have changed, but also things don't change. So we see it from the medieval up until our modern era, and it's still people vying for power, and it's still people who um, are at war with each other, and, and the death of things. Our, our, our cost design is actually in the room. <laughs> She's happy to hear me back to you. Uh, uh, we, I mean, 
mini costumes in a lot of ways are, you know, they're exciting and they've got fur and they've got leather and modern costumes are these that we see all the time. And we also had to keep the division of the Yorks and Lancasters separate throughout. And I think Lauren did a great job of kind of modernizing the rows throughout time. I went from, a, you know, an actual like flower to a leather thing to the thing here and a little lapel. Yeah, a little, yeah. little lapel, really nice. Um, and the different colors of the combat fatigues for the houses. I think I'm on the opposite side of the debate. I loved it. Um, I just came off of dramaturging um, two productions of Henry the Book Part One and Two together, and I did a full on medieval with some modern touches at, at Chesapeake Shakespeare in Baltimore. We stayed the same, uh, same actors, same costumes for the whole thing. And, um, you know, it was great. I love the costumes, love those particular people, but for me, um, one of the things that I like about going to theater when I've seen shows so many times, uh, I would love to have that response of, I never thought about it that way before. You know, so for me, it made it really the modern part of talk about immoral choices and about war and destruction and blood and murder. Um, the other thing I love about live theater is the fact that we can have, so we can sit in the same room and see the same production and have such different responses to it and have, you know, great civil engagement about that. So thank you for sharing that. That was your opinion on it. And then right here in the green sweater. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, Henry VI in the past. Uh, plays are much weaker. Uh, and, and I was very happy to see that there was some moments anyway where he was stronger. I wonder who made that decision. And I think it was a very good decision. Yeah, thanks. Um, so Jim Poulos plays Henry the Sixth, uh, and Jim's kind of extraordinary. A lot of that came from Jim. Um, Henry is the first to tell you that as a director, he's a collaborator. And the it was a small cast and the atmosphere in the rehearsal room was really that of collaboration. And he was really open to what came to the table. Um, and so Jim, uh, Jim was interested in Henry's art since he played him in all three plays. And kind of seeing him grow from a very, very weak, very weak king into somebody who maybe could have been king if someone had given him a chance. But no one did. Uh, this is uh, back to the, uh, the, 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 the weapon shift, really, more than anything else. Uh, in, in the world I live in, the only thing that's more irrational than armies shooting at one another is civilians shooting at one another. Uh, and uh, one of the things, one of the arcs I thought I saw in the play was uh, toward increasing irrationality, uh, vicious increasing in irrationality. And so, I, for me, uh, the appearance of uh, automatic weapons uh, sort of underlined, uh, it uh, made the mirror let's say, a little bit more effective. Yeah, thank you. Um, so when it comes to the act one, uh, it seemed like that was more tailored towards your classical Shakespearean audience, where you're just... Uh, okay. um, act one was tailored more towards the classical Shakespearean audience. Uh, act two, because of the shift in the props and the shift in the uh, costuming, was that more of a take to try and pull in a more modern audience to get the Shakespearean feel towards modern audience instead of the more classical feel? Um, it was really the costumes moved forward and the weapons moved forward in time uh, at points of great conflict or change. And it just part. So it, it's confusing, right? Because Act Two is Part Three of Henry's plays. So Part Three just has more conflict in it, and it, it has it has so much more war. So it, it's really just kind of a, a, a facet of um, the time and the changing and this choice that we made with the moving through time. But that, that's interesting, though. That Part Two is more for our, our mind audiences. Thank you. And then here in the orange. <laughs> <laughs> right. But anyway, I, I've, been, I've been coming to the festival since 78, and, and, and since you can see the transition from the beginning, we were told that, that 
Fred Adams and Lincoln on the dictum that there would never be anything but Shakespearean costumes on the outer stage. And so that was kind of comfortable for us, and we always knew what we would see. Somewhere around 1990, I think, they did a production, uh, I think it was, I think it was uh, Merchant of Venice, where they wore 20th century suits and stuff like on Wall Street. And I said, well, what happened to that? I said, what are we all about? So from that point on, I noticed that they, they have done a lot of things with costumes. And in the beginning, I was just like this gentleman here, wait a minute, bring back the old costumes. Don't, don't bring in these different ones from different eras. Just stick with the Shakespeare costume. But then I started to say to myself, well, it's all about the acting. So if you don't like the costume, just watch the acting and forget the costume. So that's what I do now if I don't, if I, don't, if I see a costume. <laughs> because they do so many silly things with costumes here in the festival. Wow. So but it's the acting that you really want to focus on. And, and, and that's always been great. That was great last night, too, or yesterday afternoon, I should say. Uh, so uh, that's just my two cents worth on, on that. And uh, it didn't bother me. I knew that what was what was happening. I figured there was a reason behind it. I talked to Michael Barr about it last night, and he said that they had gotten some other negative responses in, in, uh, from feedback from somebody. I don't know who was left, because this was the first time the play was open to the public. Uh, so he was a little uncomfortable about it. He said, I hope it didn't bother you. It didn't bother me, but I'm sure there'll be somebody in, in, in the seminar who would have been bothered. I don't know why they, I don't know why they don't, they don't stick to the Shakespeare costumes and all the Shakespeare plays, but uh, sometimes I think it's it's interesting to have them do a, a play where you've got a contemporary costume with costumes from another era and so forth. Uh, it's sort of an artistic design, I guess. But as long as you're into the acting, I think you can overlook a lot of the other stuff. And that's one of the things, that's how I approached it. Well, I would also add the costumes and the scenic design choices, those aesthetic choices are contributing to storytelling, and I love that we have varying opinions on it. I mean, it's fun to come to theater and say, well, I thought this, and I thought that thing. One little thing I like to share about Shakespeare's time is that, of course, when they were doing these plays, they were just contemporary clothes, right? So the Elizabethan costumes. We one drawing from a Shakespeare play from a person who attended it and drew what he saw. This very famous drawing uh, is depicting Titus and Dronius. And what we see is people in Elizabethan costumes and a couple of togas, right? So they're pulled, pulled in a couple of Roman costumes. So in Shakespeare's day, they were wearing contemporary clothing to their time, but then also pulling in things from another era. We only have that one, that one drawing to help us out there with theater history, but you know, I, I really like hearing the very opinions on that. One, yeah. last, one last comment on the costume thing. Uh, the first time this came around or so, uh, I brought it up very simply to this gentleman here. And I got ganged up on in the, in the seminar. <laughs> and everybody else said, you know, you're just too much, you're just too rigid and so forth. The director glared at the icy stairs and she mailed me. And I thought, like, well, maybe I'll get thrown out of class here. <laughs> so when that first when that first came about, uh, when they started using all the I think there was a lot more support for that than there was. They were thinking that the, the festival was evolving to something a little, a little bit more. And that's what, I think that's what we usually get to. So I just wanted to make that. Yeah, well, I think you get all of those things. We're getting some really gorgeous 17th century costume. You know, you're seeing Book of Will, you're seeing Twelfth Night, Hamlet is, is using Imperial Russia. You're getting, you're getting a lot of different palettes done, just with the plays you're seeing here. And then right here is Katie Barron on the floor. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. um, I'm going to be real brief because I just have a question. I have a questions about the um, uh, Ace Theater itself. One is it's so cold you can have B, uh, but I, 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 I don't know why that is. I have noticed that we've seen two productions in the past in there, and that's been the case. I was very pleased with the seating. Because I thought that they were going to do, um, like, have worse seats, but be able to rotate them around and change the stage and all that kind of thing. So we were very pleased when we went in and there were comfortable seats, and I think that was nice. Um, so is this permanent, the situation with the stage and the so configuration of the seats? The Ains is a true black box theater, which means that it's it, it can be rearranged forever and ever. Okay. So. <coughs> 
those will be the seats next time you're in there, though, so it won't be hard or uncomfortable. Um, uh, just for it, like, I know that other shows in there have been in, in a thrust, which is when there's a back wall and an audience on three sides. And so this in the round configuration is just for Henry, but it could come back for another show in there. Um, as for the temperature, all the facilities here are freezing. And, um, and, and actually, the Randall is actually our coldest theater. And it, it, you don't feel it as much when there's an audience in there because everyone's in there. And so you, the rehearsals are, yeah, you should see it's in rehearsal. I have a rehearsal blanket, which is really a sleeping bag that I bring in and it's kind of like bundled up because it's freezing. I'm, I'm sorry, I, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to. I'd like to hear you talk about the choice of the actor for Richard the Third. I was very off put that you used that small, pretty woman to to portray Richard, and uh, it, the the character for me only really came alive when at the very end, when when, when she was wearing those heavy boots and that long uh, uh, coat. To, to to me, that seemed like Richard. But when she was in that, those other costumes seemed kind of small and feminine, you know, despite the words. Sure. Um, so we were interested in the idea that this is young Richard. He's, he's the youngest of these brothers. So we wanted him to look small. So casting a woman um, was kind of a clear choice um, it, for this, especially just because of the ensemble nature of this casting process. Um, and also, Emily O'Hara, who plays Richard, is a very gifted actress. Um, uh, so, we wanted Richard to be small, and we wanted him to be a little bit more unassuming as a, as a like, young man. Um, and so, the fact that he didn't look like Richard to you until the final scene when he was in that coat means that we were doing our job. Pretty well, actually. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, uh, because it, it's Henry the Sixth Part Three is so extraordinary because we watch Richard turn into what he will be in the third. And then right here in the purple, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about Margaret and a woman sort of leading the troops. Yes, I love Margaret. <laughs> um, uh, so. Queen Margaret, this is uh, true to her historically, too. Um, Henry VI, her husband, was not good in battle. He, he was not a military leader. He really just wanted to be a priest. Um, so when the War of the Roses started, the English, the House of Lancaster, needed a general. And so Margaret just did it. It was just her and her son. Um, and in real life, she wore armor and she went to battle. And, it was really kind of an amazing thing. And I think Stephanie Lambert, who plays Margaret, does a great job. She's a shorter actress, actually, that I think really just fills the space. Um, and so it's also very interesting to watch her art, which is a very complete one in Shakespeare. She's in four plays. She's also in Richard. Um, and she goes from being a young, hopeful French princess to a, a, a warrior queen. Um, and then into kind of a creepy prophet in Richard III. I think um, a couple years ago when the American Shakespeare Center did the Henry plays, they actually retitled this one for advertising. I think they called it The Rise of Queen Margaret. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it, is, it is her play, right? Mm -hmm. And then back here in the back down. Uh, I just want to comment on uh, three of the uh, casting choices uh, the extraordinary actors, uh, Dan Kramer, uh, Michael Ellick, and uh, James Newcomb. Uh, I actually have to credit uh, Dan Kramer for uh, getting me started on being a uh, Shakespeare freak as far as coming to shows. Uh, in 1977, I was uh, at Ashton Oregon, the first time working Shakespeare, and he was cast uh, as the Duke in uh, Measure for Measure. And I realized about 20 minutes into the show, I'm coming here for the rest of my life. And I started coming here in 1992, and I feel the same way about. You tell Shakespeare as well. Anyway, I just thought uh, those three actors uh, did amazing, were utterly amazing as far as making every character they uh, portrayed uh, very, very distinctive. I didn't see any overlap or similarity between any of the characters that those three gentlemen were portraying. And I 
که من ازم در تاماس بیره I lost count how many times Dan Kramer came out of a different uh, get-up, and his, his character was always vastly different from one to the other. No, yeah. no danger of his ever being typecast, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, Dan Kramer played Blaster, Jack Cade, and a bunch of others. Um, Michael Elledge is the Duke of York um, in the brown coat, and uh, Jamie Newcomb plays Warwick. How many characters are there in these two plays? Do you know? I would have to count, but it's definitely over 40. Um, higher? How many is it? 82. That's from our, our costume designer. But individual costumes for each each part. Um, and how many actors were there? 12. Amazing, right? And we cut some characters. 160 in both plays total. <laughs> there was a, 160 characters in both plays funnel, and Lauren designed for part one, part two, and part three, which is like truly a feat. <laughs> two, two questions, if I may. Uh, uh, one is uh, I, if the costume designers here, I would love to have them come up. Walk through the changes in the evolution because, as somebody who hadn't seen the play before, it took me a while to figure out what was going on. Like, wait a minute, that's a good, that's a rifle. And wait, you know, that, you know, and so I, I'm sure there's tons of stuff I missed uh, while I was uh, processing the plot and keeping track of of the characters. Uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, this is this is a, a challenging play, at least for me. You know, what, I, what I look for, and what I try to look for in the play for books is, is some character that I can latch on to, I can, oh, I can relate to what they're going through. It was very hard for me in this material. So, there's a, a lot of people doing really horrible things, you know, and, and, and a lot of the characters, speaking of Game of Thrones, if you have a character that you start to listen by, they're going to die, you know. <laughs> you know it's like the, the only people that you don't hate are, tend to be either weak and ineffectual, or they, or they get locked off because you know, they won't surrender their values, you know, and then they're determined to do the right thing even if it compromises them or their heirs. How would Shakespeare, who would Shakespeare, I mean, this, I think there's a few people in the play, like, uh, well, for me, at least the warrior queen and Richard, who the audience clearly is not supposed to be rooting for because they're just so hateful uh, towards the end, especially. Who, who would Shakespeare's audience have been rooting for? Who, who did they see as the good guys? Or were there any that said clearly in this book? Sure. So I'm going to answer that question, and then we'll give a mic to Lauren just to talk about her costumes just for a minute. Um, so there's a complicated question because so Shakespeare's audiences, their queen is Queen Elizabeth, whose line comes through Henry VI. So Shakespeare has to be careful with how he treats some of her ancestors, otherwise he will be killed. <laughs> so we can take more liberties now, um, but at, at the time, the kind of as a kind of a neutral or positive spin on the ancestors of the current monarch, House of Tudor. Um, and Shakespeare, throughout his canon, asks the question: Is it possible to be a good leader and a good person? And he starts asking that question in these early plays. And I don't think he ever really answers that question, but you see it from Henry VI, part one, all the way up through Coriolanus, um, which is one of his darkest plays he ever wrote. Um, and so he's just interested in what power does to the everyday person and what power does to a line of people. So as to who the good guys are, I think it depends on how you're feeling when you go in there on any given day and you know, if, if, if there's a character who even just has one line that you can kind of latch on to, um, I think it's a really personal journey with these plays. Lauren? Back here, we have a little costume designer. Hey, everyone. Um, so just a little bit about the costumes. Uh, as you have mentioned and noticed, there was a distinct shift. We started um, in medieval clothing. The idea behind that was that we would start exactly where we left off in part one. We recreated that moment of, of Suffolk and the Queen together, and, and that's where we began. So we're, 
we're truly in a, in a Game of Thrones medieval world. Um, and throughout the play, we shift, as you know, into 2019. The idea behind that being that, um, that we're holding the mirror up to ourselves, that we're seeing the same thing repeat over and over and over throughout history. So within the costume design, there are five major shifts from medieval to modern. Um, we didn't want you to feel each one of those shifts in a very harsh way. Um, so what you see is sort of a slow transition. Um, people who, who, who keep the same way of thinking throughout the entire play stayed in the same costume throughout the entire play. Right? We never saw York change his look because he always had one goal in mind, and that was to be king in the beginning of the play until his death. Uh, we see shifts happen with deaths of, of older generations, of um, deaths of people who were in power, and new powers taking over. So that first shift we see comes when Gloucester and the Cardinal both die. Gloucester is, of course, murdered, and the Cardinal um, is, dies of the altar. Um, it goes crazy. So we see that first shift, and that's where Jack Cade and his friends coming in. Um, in that, we're seeing some medieval silhouettes, but we're also seeing zip-up hoodies. We're seeing um, combat boots for the first time. Uh, all of those sort of small details that take us a little more modern. The next shift then comes when we meet Edward's, the Duke of York's sons. Um, so when we meet Edward and Richard for the first time, um, we become a little more streamlined. We're seeing shorter tunics, we're seeing combat boots, right? We're seeing more of the skinny jeans that they're all wearing underneath their costumes. Um, so some of those more modern details. That takes us into part three, right? We're still in part three, seeing Henry in medieval clothes, we're seeing Margaret saying some of those things, but then these new generations, new people coming in have more modern accents. Um, the next shift in power comes when Henry uh, is taken to the tower and Edward becomes king. Uh, we see a jump there. Um, that's when we first start seeing those sort of World War One-ish um, tunics. Uh, we're not really specifically in any period, right? But we sort of see some silhouettes from um, English Civil War, we see some silhouettes from World War One, and then we see modern sort of channel. And so they're slow shifts, but they take us into that very last moment of the play where we're seeing very modern suits, swing cut, we're seeing ankle and no sock for the skin. But, uh, all of these things that feel very, very modern. And then, of course, Richard, um, who is in a darker palette than the rest of the folks because they think everything is fine at the end of the play and that they ever will rule happily. And Richard, of course, knows that that is not true and has a plan to take them down. So, um, some of the choices too in the costumes were for practicality's sake. Um, the actors, as you know, it's a really small space. You build almost the entire theater with, with audience. And um, so, actors were changing behind those seating risers at almost all points of the play. Um, and so we kept a base costume on for most of the play, for most of the actors, um, adding pieces on the top so that we could keep the play moving really quickly. So uh, besides just the shift in period, there were lots of exciting sort of challenges uh, and problems to solve as far as the practicality of 12 actors playing close to 90 roles um, in a small space where they were constantly on the stage. Thank you so much. I'd like to note the modern edge that stayed even from part one with the skinny jeans and the, uh, and the boots. The modern edge is always there with the leathers and the specific textiles. I, I especially want to thank you for that explanation. That was very helpful to me. Um, I, I realized as you were speaking that I hadn't fully appreciated the changes that occurred just in part two. And now that you said that, I, I remember, oh okay, yeah, I noticed that, but it, it didn't fully hit me until the more radical changes in part three, and so I, I come away from the place thinking, oh boy, I really did get two plates for the price of time. <laughs> um, but I have a question. Okay, thank you for that. But my question hasn't been positive, but in fact, it's a very minor question, but it is still something that puzzled me. At the very beginning of part two, very beginning of the play, um, I had um, uh, Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, reads the parchment of the message from France stating that um, Margaret is to marry Henry, and then announces the loss of Anjou and Maine. 
And of course, that's very upsetting to him immediately. That's upsetting to all the others in the office. But, it, but the, the way the gentleman who played that role, Dan Crank, mm -hmm. uh, the way he did, read that puzzled me because I thought, and when I read the, the I didn't know, I didn't know really what was going on at the beginning in the sense that um, he seemed to read it at a very even keel. Like he was almost upset. He certainly was upset by the time he gets to Anju and May, but he seemed to be almost kind of upset that Henry was married to Margaret. And I thought, I, I read that, I think I've seen other productions where that, that's kind of a, it's read as a happy occasion. And then he gets to the Anju and May, and it's all of a sudden distraught and drops the letter. Yeah, so those letters are, it's bad news and not bad news. So Margaret actually is a bad choice for Henry. Um, she's she's a princess, so she's um, her father is the king of Naples and Jerusalem, which are just titles. It doesn't actually come with wealth or power. So Margaret, there's no dowry with her. So the, the English crown gets no benefit from marrying her, and she's not from um, one of the wealthy parts of France that England needs alliance with. So in part one, we actually see that Henry is engaged to be married to a different French princess. Um, and he swears an oath that he's gonna marry her, and then Suffolk meets Margaret basically in a battlefield, and Suffolk falls in love with Margaret, and then Suffolk, it's Suffolk's plan that Henry's gonna marry Margaret, and so Suffolk comes back to England and tells Henry how beautiful Margaret is, and how amazing she is, and Henry falls in love with her description, forsakes his original oath of marriage, um, and marries Margaret instead. And there's a line in the play where Henry basically says, um, if I hadn't broken my oath, then none of this would have happened. And he's probably right, because the original princess who he's going to marry was, um, of, was an actual princess, and her family came with power and titles and money, and it would have forged a more lasting peace. He has to give up those territories in order to marry her. So not only does he not get it, I mean, that's the two things that the thing loses, that he makes this really disadvantageous agreement in order to have her. He doesn't gain a dowry, and he has to give up some stuff to have her as well. And then here the blue. I'm um, sorry, I sort of hate to come back to the casting. <laughs> um, the, uh, and this may have just been an entirely practical need the only casting choice that didn't ring true for me was Lady Grey, where you have the same actress playing a woman of a certain age and then playing uh, another woman two generations younger than her original character. And the actress herself, I just, I would guess, it's not appear to me to be a childbearing age. And yet here she is coming on stage with, with child, uh, you know, towards the end. And, um, so that it was awkward to me, and those many people just thought that. We all play parts that we aren't. Um, Emily's not a murderer, but she's like Richard. You know, uh, we thought it was more important that we had a good actress in the part, and that we had an actress who could play um, Lady Eleanor in the beginning, which was a very challenging role. Uh, and we needed a really versatile actress, and so Sarah, who plays that, is. Um, she's actually Welsh, and so her ability to have different voices and accents for all those tiny parts that she played was really invaluable to the process. And then here in the black and white. Um, what was the relationship between Henry and Salford? Uh, why did he trust Salford's arrangement so much, and who arranged the first uh, potential wedding with the other princess in why would Salford? Sure. A little contrary to them. So the first arranged marriage was from his uncle Gloucester. Um, so it, and and then it, and that's the first thing that Henry ever does against his uncle is marry somebody else. Um, the Suffolk is aligned with the House of Lancaster, so he and Henry are like casual allies, um, and they're around the same age, and he trusts him because he has no reason not to trust him. And one of Henry's flaws is that he is overly trusting. And then here in the pink. Um, well, I was just following up on Larry's question, but I think um, something you just said might answer that. So I think Larry was um, saying that when that first speeches, or when he's uh, first reading um, the letter, 
um, that initially, the way it's generally been played, is that it's kind of um, happy news until he reads that it's given up the territories and the mentioned has no dowry. But perhaps he read it because um, it was contrary to what he had originally set up. So I guess in that context, it would make sense that he already had a marriage arranged that would have been advantageous. So anything that, and, and he does, he's not, I don't think he is um, friendly with Suffolk, so he probably doesn't trust him. Class three he is friendly with Suffolk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so maybe he just even without knowing some of that later information, he just doesn't trust him. Yeah, that's probably why he. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It was a question. And then no, that's okay. And we were also interested in setting up uh, Margaret and Gloucester as enemies from the very beginning. So if he immediately doesn't like the news of her or her presence, then it, it makes their conflict a little bit more clear since she kind of does lead to his death. <laughs> um, I was just wondering why uh, they decided to have it as one play, or I guess two different parts in the same day, instead of split up into two separate days, or at least like a matinee and an evening performance of part two and part three. It's kind of a practical question. Um, it's easier to sell tickets for both parts than with just Henry the Sixth Part Two, um, and, and we realize it's a very long evening of the, or afternoon of theater, uh, and we appreciate all of you sitting through it too and enjoying it. Um, uh, we also just thought that the overall arc of both plays together makes sense together. So only having a half an hour break as opposed to a 24 hour break, it doesn't give you enough time to exit the world. You're still in it. So you, you come back in and your brain is already acclimated to Shakespeare's language. Um, and you, you remember who all those characters are. It hasn't been enough time for you to forget. So and we knew last year that was going to be the choice. Yes. Just really, really briefly, uh, I, I, the only thing I campaign for, you know, is, is one more bathroom break. <laughs> I, I was dying before we got that half of my brother. You're like, oh, hold on. I guess it helped me stay awake, but it was a little bit. Of course, doing both of those plans in the amount of time that you gave them led to an enormous amount of cutting. Uh, uh, and I, I compliment you on how. Uh, unobtrusively, you made the cuts. Although I will say, I, I really miss the killing of Robin at the beginning of part three. Um, it made the scene where she throws the bloody handkerchief at York a little inexplicable for those who may not have seen it before. Yeah, I mean, we had Rutland get killed, um, but what we did cut was the previous scene with Rutland in York. Um, which kind of establishes their relationship. Uh, so I, it's, it's more of an emotional leap that the audience has to make. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, so it was a long evening for all of us, but I can only imagine what the actors are going through. Do you have any insights to how they're able to pull off the eight characters that they have to play to get through the entire night? And then some of them do another show that evening. But yeah, nope. <laughs> uh, endurance training. Uh, uh, they're all pros. Um, they all knew what they were signing up for. That's very important. Nobody showed up and was like, "How is how long?" I'm like, "Who?" Um, and the rehearsal process. Uh, Henry had a few more rehearsals than the other shows because it was two plays. Masquerading was one in, in, in the rehearsal schedule, um, and so we, the team, everyone just just kind of worked at building different characters as, as, as we went. Uh, different voices emerged, different choices, different walking styles, and um, the costumes really helped with that a lot too. But otherwise, can you imagine everybody who was just in like a single costume where it's like theater blacks kind of follow what was happening? <laughs> who was on whose side? And then here's the door blast. I'd like to mention that having the two plays together on the same afternoon was very helpful for me. Instead of having to split them up either to the next day or the next year, I mean, you have to refresh your memory on what's the back history of this whole thing to bring it to Henry, the third part. I also, I, I like the half hour in between. I, I think that was a good idea 
Because, I mean, how early are you going to start a play like that? How much earlier than one o'clock can you start? And then you've got afternoon plays, or I'm sorry, evening plays. So it worked for me, even though it is a long afternoon and way too many, so many characters to have to plow through. Yeah, it, but it really worked for me. Love, well, thank you. The next word, black. I just have a, a sort of a scholarly question because I, I'm sure you've researched this. I understand that there's some debate as to what the order of uh, the composition of the three parts is, and, I, uh, and that in particular part two and part, well, I think part three may have been written before part one. Yeah. And I wonder what your opinion is on that. Yeah, there's different, you know, Shakespeare, who knows, but you know, the, the scholarship, um, the popular idea is that Shakespeare wrote parts two and three together and that they were done before and they're published together in um, a book called The Whole and Complete Contention of, and then the title is like four lines long. Um, <laughs> we call it the, the, the contention for short. Um, and then some people think that then he went back and wrote part one um, because of, of the success of parts two and three. Uh, and now, of course, uh, people over at the, the Oxford editions think that Marlowe co wrote parts two and three with him and actually putting his name on the edition. I have some thoughts about that. <laughs> uh, personally, I think that he wrote part one first because if you read them sequentially, he he threads the characters together in such a way, and part one kind of hints at part two without it feeling like he already knows what he's writing in part two and three. Um, that's just my own opinion from being around these plays so much. Uh, my master's thesis is actually on these plays. <laughs> I love them that much. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with them. And, and, and that's what I think. Um, I, and I don't actually I don't think I'm the majority. I think most people think he wrote two and three and then part one. And then back here, the black. Uh, something you said earlier as well. Uh, remind me of the line of play that uh, really is going to stick with me forever. I found the paper for an hour. Uh, when Jim Poulos and Henry says some good effect, we really have to work on becoming better leaders. Yeah, and, and that line govern better. Govern better. Right? That, that line really resonated for me. If people doubt the contemporary relevance of Shakespeare, uh, <laughs> yeah. a, line, a line like that, uh, <laughs> Certainly establishes the uh, brilliance, the relevance, and anyway, thank you. It's something the government doesn't seem to change. Just a question about uh, previous productions. I think something that would help me a little bit for the passage of time. And I know this is a lot of people kind of nightmare. Having the actors, having different actors for different ages, particularly it was distracting, even though I loved uh, Henry, the yeah, guy playing Henry, because this takes place over such a long period of time and looking still very kind of young and vague, it was a little distracting to me. But uh, have in previous productions that they had different actors for parts two and three. The last time they did this was. 2000? It's on the sheet. Um, it was a while ago, before my time. Um, the last one was 2000, where they called it the board. Yeah. yeah, so it was a conflation of all three plays last time that they did it. Um, and it was in, 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 in 2000 called The War of the Roses. Um, I'm not 100% sure if we did the adaptation, it was the kind of famous one from RSC or not. Um, so I, I don't I don't I don't know. I would guess that it, it had more traditional casting just because it was treated as one play. So it was greatly reduced because it was parts one, two, and three, and like a three hour play. Oh, and here's a fun fact. It was directed by Howard Jensen, who was USF's first Hamlet in 1962. I see him up on the wall. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Did anybody else have another question? Okay. Uh, you gave, I gave you your chance. Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, my, I still hope that you could have shaved 10 minutes off that three minute break. But, uh, you know, 
you know, and, 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 you know the, the, the wisdom or, or need of, of having it all together instead of selling it to a different place. I am thrilled that this company that has a lot of money at stake and a lot of loyal fans with a lot of peace is going to take the artistic risks with their plays. Not just because it actually did help me stay awake and pay attention to what was going on. Wait, what? You know, Camo, you know. Uh, but then it just, you know, these plays, a lot of them, you know, you may, I don't know how many more chances you're going to have to perform this play that would have been a real temptation. Let's do this as traditionally and as safely as we can. It's very rare to see them separately see their own productions. Most theater companies do some version of, of combined. Yeah, well, I just know uh, everything with the, with the music and the staging and the costuming and everything. I mean, whether every risk pays off or works for everybody, to me, if you're not willing to, to take artistic risks, you're, you're doing it wrong. You're not, you're not living up to your responsibility of potential as artists and to make Shakespeare relevant and exciting and new, you know, and, and do something that hasn't been done before. So uh, my hat's off to you guys. Thank you. Like that. I'll let Henry know. He's definitely a risk taker. So <laughs> well, that's a great final comment. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs>